UK house prices have defied expectations of a slowdown, and the recently released Halifax House Price Index for June has shown that prices across the UK have risen at their fastest rate in 18 years, up 13% year-on-year, up from 10.5% in the previous month. What's going on? What's the trajectory, given that interest rates are rising and household budgets are put to an extreme test with soaring energy prices? Welcome to IG's Trading the Markets podcast. I'm Jeremy Naylor. I'm pleased to be joined today by Guy Harrington, the chief executive of Glenhawk, a challenger lender that's been benefiting from a trend among some consumers who are looking at alternative lenders instead of high street banks to complete transactions. Guy, welcome. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. Before we get into the mechanics of what's happening in the property market at the moment, just explain more about your business, your your business model, and how it dovetails with traditional lenders? Yeah, certainly. So um, Glenhawk's a non-bank lender. And, and when I say non-bank, we are not funded by retail deposits like uh, your your high street banks or, or your challenger banks. Are. We're funded by uh, uh, hedge funds and um, investment banks with uh, JP Morgan being our, our main, uh, main investment bank uh, behind the group. And we lend to uh, property developers and investors throughout the UK on projects ranging from a £200,000 flat renovation in, let's say, Milton Keynes, all the way to a large uh, commercial uh, shopping centre re-gearing in Manchester, let's let's say, uh, that could be around £5 million. And our financing is very much a strategic tool. It's used for a short period of time, up to six to seven months. And really, it's uh, to allow the developer or the investor to acquire the asset stabilize and either rent out or uh, stabilize, renovate, and then rent out or or, or sell uh, the onward uh, to, to an onward purchaser. So it's very much a, a quick tool for uh, high net worth investors uh, to acquire property, uh, whether it's at auction or uh, strategically um, through other means. We've been going around uh, four years now. So we've been through uh, the effects of uh, Brexit, uh, the elections, Ukraine, and uh, of course, uh, COVID. Uh, at present, we lend uh, annualised run rate of around 400 million and our, our loan sizes on average on our portfolio are 650,000 at present. So quite a molecular portfolio. So I can certainly speak to speak about what uh, we're seeing on uh, on the, the smaller end of the market and, uh, and, and trends um, that we're starting to see come through at the moment. Just a bit more about the profile of your client base. Likely to be UK or are you engaging with overseas clients as well? No, we're we're predominantly UK. Um, it's not uh, it's not wrong of me to say that we did have some uh, Russian inquiries towards uh, the early part of this year uh, when uh, when uh, clearly things started happening in Ukraine, and obviously we we turned those clients down. But um, no, it's uh, it's all UK based uh, UK clients. And and the split between professional investors and and, pr- and private sort of retail clients. Do you do you tend on the whole to have relationships with these professionals who are in and out of this uh, sort of market quickly, relatively quickly? Yes, uh, we class all our uh, all our borrowers as uh, as professional. And when I mean professional, they really have a minimum of three assets in their portfolio. We don't lend to first time uh, landlords as such. We, uh, we'd like to have a bit of a track record and a bit of experience before we before we deploy, uh, especially if it's a refurbishment project. So yeah, I'd say uh, semi-professional to professional. So we, we have clients that may have three units and we have one client who has over 1500 units. So uh, it, it really does depend and it's you've got everyone uh, in between those two numbers in there. Yeah. Given the red hot housing market, what's Glen Hawke's current lending account worth? You you went through some interesting stats there, but I don't think you covered the amount that you've got lent out to clients at the moment. What sort of size of account have you got? Yeah. So in terms of the actual value of the, the, the underlying real assets or the assets under management, um, it's well over half a billion at the moment. Um, and as I say, that's split up with uh, with average loan sizes of 600 to 650,000. A small portion of that is on our regulated lending side, which uh, we lend to homeowners, um, regulated deals, which wish, wish to essentially bridge the gap between their purchases. They may be moving from, which we saw during the pandemic, from London out to the Cotswolds or out to Cornwall. However, we're seeing a slight reversal on that. 
on that now that you're seeing those that have bought properties in the countryside think, well, I quite like the allure of the city again. And some are selling up and actually reversing their move back uh, back into the capital or uh, whether they moved, uh, they're in the centre of Manchester and they moved up the countryside and they've done vice versa. So certainly a trend we're seeing on the on the regulated side is a, is a reversal of that, which um, is perhaps happening around maybe a little bit earlier than I thought it would. I thought we'd be at least another six, seven months out before we started to see some sort of influx back into the cities, that's for sure. That's an interesting point. Uh, where do you see um, the house prices going? I mean, they, they've been defying gravity, seemingly. Uh, and, and you mentioned um, since the, 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 the four years you've been in operation, you, you mentioned a number of what might have been perceived as potential headwinds, which in fact turned out not to be the sort of headwind that really dented this market very much. Brexit, at the um, run of elections we had, of course, Theresa May didn't last very long. Now we're back in the situation again where we got the incumbent government looking for um, a new leader. So politically, very, very strange times. Do you have to sort of close your mind to this or do you have to bend and flex uh, to what the government of the day brings? Does, is, is, does legislation and, and the determination to bring house prices down really affect your market? Yeah, that's a very good question. And if you look at who we lend to, that is speculative development. And really, it would be one of the first to feel a slowdown as such of, of inquiries and, and and flow. And certainly in the last, I'd say, four to five weeks, when there has been this really intense political scrutiny uh, and, and media barrage, which has really come to a head now and detracted a lot from Ukraine and clearly the, the, the sad is, issues that are happening there. So we've started to see a little bit of a slowdown and we don't, we're trying to work it out. And a lot of the borrowers are either just being a little bit more cautious about going into the market or they're looking for even more of a discount or an opportunity. And they're not really finding it because there's a lot of liquidity out there still. And there's not really that many deals. There are deals, of course, like in any market. However, there's a lot of money hunting those deals. So we haven't seen a, a slowdown that I'd be worried about as such. However, going back to your, your, your point a, a moment ago there, Jeremy, is that the warehouse prices where I, where do I think they'll go? Which is the which is the multi million pound question that everybody wishes they could <laughs> that they could see through their crystal ball. And I was having breakfast this morning with one of the um, top uh, global investment bankers in the world, and I said, put this question to him. I said, where do you think house prices are going to go? And he said to me, guy, I asked five analysts the other day in our firm uh, where they think it's going to go, and he got five different answers. <laughs> and it's not really as binary as let's say and an online electrical retailer that's quite well known that's been hit in the last few days um, through inflationary pressures, through losing credit insurance and various problems. Clearly, the fundamentals there show that that, that stock or that business has declined and may decline further. However, when it comes to the housing market, you look at where we are, we have a chronic lack of supply. I think something like 800,000 more homes need to be built right now to catch up with, with demand. And Quite frankly, the houses we build in the UK are, are utter rubbish. The quality, the style, really, they're just put up as piggy banks to the investors. But I think that's a whole, whole other conversation to have. But if you start to tie everything together, there's still an underlying demand in this country for an Englishman's home is his castle. And I really don't see that going away. And I can't see house prices slipping. I can see some stagnation coming up as those that perhaps bought during COVID want to trade out and they want to move quickly and they want to move either back into a city or to another opportunity. They may find that they're not underwater, but they may have a slight equity haircut from moving on to, to another unit. So yeah, I think it, in summary, stagnation is where I see it happening. But then saying that when we were going into COVID, I'm on paper somewhere or on audio saying that I thought house prices were going to get hit extremely hard after the furlough scheme ended. But the government support that was pumped into the market, which was totally unnecessary and wasn't needed at all, um, pumped, the, pumped the market and created even more inflation in the house prices. And I think the only way that we're going to see some sort of slowdown and some sort of normality rather than this one, one and a half percent a month increase is going to be when a lot of the cheap fixed rates that were taken out during COVID expire in the next 18 to 24 months. And when that happens, uh, there's going to be a lot more stress testing on people's incomes. Banks will perhaps be a little more tighter on their credit controls. And, and then we'll start to see a bit of a slowdown. But I really don't see 10 to 15 percent drops that we've seen elsewhere. Um, as I say, Englishmen's homes, their castle. And I see that yeah. continuing and um, 
for, for quite a long time going forward. Just just going back, if I can, and touching on the business model in, in picking up a point you just mentioned there, do you have exactly the same regulations that um, command the um, business lending that you achieve? Do you have the same regulations that a normal bank would have? I mean, we're talking here about a challenger lender, not, not a bank. I know you're not a bank, mm. but do you have, is, is there a, um, a, a sort of an equivalent uh, within the traditional lending sector of what you're doing, or are you doing something very different, regulated in a very different way? Yeah, so on, on the regulated side, we, we we can't give advice to our, our our clients. So on the regulated bridge loans, as I mentioned, it's someone moving from their main residence or their sole dwelling into uh, another property, which will be designated as their sole dwelling. So the regulatory piece um, is, is quite important there. We don't give the advice. The intermediary or the broker, the regulated intermediary or broker gives the advice uh, and then we we facilitate the loan. However, we treat the two sides of the business completely separate, separately. The regulatory side is, is is paramount to us. You have to be incredibly careful how you operate. And for us as a group, we see that as a, a, a tool for growth. There's not many lenders in our space that embrace regulation like we do. We see it as a key to growing the, growing the business. The unregulated side, the, the exact definition is surrounding the intended use of the property. So if the uh, borrower is going to live in it or has lived in it, even if they've rented it or a family member has rented it or lived in it previously or intends to, that's a regulated loan. And that will go down a regulated loan route, which has to go via a regulated intermediary. And we we can't touch that directly. The unregulated route is for investment or predominantly business purposes. And as I mentioned earlier, most of our borrowers have three assets or more. So uh, comfortably yeah. around 85, 90 percent of the portfolio falls into that. So, yeah, two two very different buckets of, of how we operate. We will yeah. push the, the regulated lending further as we grow. Soon we're going to launch a, a homeowner 25 year product. Um, we, we have our uh, variation of permissions in with the FCA at the moment, and that will be small balance loans to homeowners for debt consolidation and, uh, and various home improvement um, purposes as well. Mm. Let's pick up on the point as well about your um, suggestion that we're going to see a stagnation of prices. I'd like, if I can, to look at the potential headwinds because Bank of England base lending rate currently, what, one and a quarter percent. Uh, we've mm. seen a number of rises. In fact, I think the BOE was one of the first uh, mature market um, uh, lenders to raise rates at the back end of last year, wasn't it? It was a, mm. a small percentage point increase. Um, surely, if we see the BOE undertake its plan to try and get on top of inflation, I want to talk about inflation as a separate issue in just a minute. Surely, the trajectory for interest rates is up. Now, that, to me, from someone that talks about the housing market, but I'm not, I'm not exposed to it the way, obviously, you are, but surely that is a headwind which could ultimately see prices drop. People are not going to be able to afford an increase in interest rates. Yeah, that, it's, it's a really interesting one. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing from, from my boots on the ground in, I, I still do some property development now, so I tend to speak to quite a few agents day to day. And what we're seeing quite oddly at the moment is a lot of people wanting to borrow now and maximise their leverage, maximise the amount of term they can take, purely because they think, well, interest rates are going to go up. I want to upgrade to a bigger home now. I want to move out. I want to stretch myself. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it now before rates go up to, I mean, I was looking at the swap rate data about half an hour ago, and it looks like it's going to settle at about 3%, 2.8% by uh, by Q2, Q3 next year. So we, we do have quite a substantial raise to come, but then you have the borrowers now which are taking advantage of that. And I, I still think that even when you look at the stress testing that the lenders put in place uh, on the borrowers at the moment, that even with the rates at those levels, which are incredibly low historically um, to, to what we've seen over the last 20 years or so, um, that's not going to put the pressure we would expect on the housing market that would cause uh, a reduction in the in the values or even increased stagflation. So I think it's... Um, I personally think it won't affect it that much. However, there will be some that can't afford. There'll be an increase in renters. There'll be an increase in uh, buy-to-let units. Um, however, I think we're some way off that happening. If rates were creeping towards five, then I could see it happening. But it's going to be a very gradual increase in interest rates. And it's forecast as well. We can all see it coming. It has to go up to offset the inflation. So um, it's not going to be a surprise. It's not overnight they're jumping to five. Uh, and at the end of the day, the consumer has to be cautious and the banks are cautious ever since 2008. So I, I, I don't see it being a uh, rate driven um, reduction in prices uh, at this point in time anyway. 
Yeah, what about inflation trends uh, as well? I mean, this is a big headwind. Uh, Bank of England forecasts, I think, 11% CPI now. Does that fall in line with your expectations? I mean, we talk about the continuation of the uptick in in, in the base lending rate. I mean, it has to, the, the Bank of England obviously has its target on this 2% inflation rate. Goodness, that <laughs> seems a long while ago now. Um, and, uh, yeah, the bank's got to do something about this. Do, do you what's 11 percent inflation going to do because people again going back to this question about the fact they can't bear higher interest rates of those that are locked into a longer term low rates that's great um but every day everybody is seeing an increase in fuel prices petrol prices at the pump um the electricity prices in the home gas prices mm-hmm. in the home food prices in the shops f- footwear clothing prices you name it <laughs> it's on the way up and yeah. You know, this is again. I go back to this idea about surely this is going to see a deterioration in the housing market and bring house prices down, isn't it? Well, I mean, you're right, Jeremy. And I mean, fundamentally, you look at the data there. You look at inflation, which I, I personally think is far higher than the figures they have there. I think the way the way it's calculated isn't quite correct, and it's almost masked the true level of inflation. I mean, if you look at some of our borrowers on our Um, let's say, development projects, the cost of concrete, the cost of raw materials, that during a three-month period, some of them have been seeing them go up by 25, 30% for the materials. And look at fuel. And we're at, I filled up two days ago, and it's 202 a litre. And it was one, what was it, 148 nearly a year ago. And bringing it down to something day-to-day, such as a pint of beer in a a local pub near the office, it was £6.20 coming out of uh, out of COVID, and now it's uh, eight pound twenty. I think it's one of the most expensive pints in London. And it's just every everywhere and everywhere you go, you're just getting hit in the pocket, and you get to the end of the month and go, "Crikey, where's that all gone?" So I think the tr- the true figure is far higher than that. However, I don't see that translating into a, a slowdown in the housing market yet. I mean, I'm starting to see some early data that perhaps the inflation is going to come down spending is going to be reducing at the moment certainly when i look around the office and do a, a straw poll of we only have 50 uh, 50 in the team here and the younger members of the team are saying well i'm, I'm taking less deliveries i'm spending i've deleted my netflix or i've cancelled sky so you're starting to see that spending become reined in and I know we're probably not the barometer of the United Kingdom in the office here. However, I think from what I'm seeing, people are being more cautious. They're spending less, which is what the the government ultimately wants to try and get. But I think the the downside, I mean, the upside for the government was the rail strikes the other month, which perhaps uh, caused the, the the economy to slow slightly and maybe eased inflation a little bit. However, the uh, all the flights that are being cancelled at the moment is no good because you can have an extra million people in the United Kingdom over the next eight weeks spending it. So it's um, it's not a position I'd like to be in, um, especially when it comes to controlling inflation. And as we know, you, you pop the rates up, that controls it. However, people have got a lot of money in their pockets. There's still something like 200 billion in savings accounts in this country. So people are going to spend um, when times look good, they'll spend. And when times look bad, they'll probably spend. And the mindset coming out of COVID is perhaps, well, you know what, that was a pretty awful few years for everybody. Um, if it happens again, I'll I'll go out and buy that car. I'll go out and do that, which is probably why we're seeing such an asset bubble, whether it's in housing, cars, watches or whatever, whatever you fancy. It's um, it's all gone crazy at the moment. Yeah. Um, just if I can, uh, to I know you're a, a private company, so you, you don't have to divulge the inner workings of the balance sheet and profit and loss account. But I would if I could like to try and ask you a question about the amount of bad debt you see potentially within that half billion sterling of short-term finance you're out in the market with at the moment do you have a can you talk a little bit about the sort of um the deterioration of the part of the market that isn't going to repay that loan is it is it something you're fearful of um i mean i i don't mind divulging exact figures but at the moment we have one loan um of 2.5 million that's technically in default and um uh, in arrears and will ultimately be be collected on at some point um if, if the borrower doesn't uh, th- doesn't redeem so as a percentage of the portfolio our default rate is perhaps lower than some high street banks which is down to our diligent lending and uh, and experience but I think from from the way we lend, just coming back onto that point now with the, with the diligence and experience, we always underwrite our loans to an exit. So we always try and make sure, well, that bank's going to take us out on that deal, that building society or refires at that point. And we always do that at the start with the underwriters. So we're not what you could call some lenders operate from a loan to own perspective. We're very much 
transactional, build the relationship, redeem the loan. OK, come back again. We'll give you another loan and so on. Whereas some lenders don't like to work like that and they have um, certain reputations in the marketplace. So I suppose from my side, the, the, the people we lend to, I don't think we'll see those pressures. They have multiple units in their portfolio and they will redeem and they will uh, be smart enough to, to to exit the loans before it comes to an enforcement situation. So from our side, the developer will be one of the last um, to get out of the market, I think. They'll always be trying to seek out opportunities and seek out yields. So from a business perspective, I don't expect to see those those bad debts rising. And certainly from speaking to uh, large uh, banks and uh, investors over the past week or so, they're not seeing anything deteriorating on their balance sheet either, which, as I say, we're a pretty good indicator and an early barometer for any deterioration in the wider market. So touch words, um, everything's looking OK so far, apart from a slight drop in inquiries, which I'd, I'd put down to the um, the political uncertainty. Yeah, well, let's let's pick up on that point as well, because um, over the last few weeks, especially in the weekend papers, there's a lot of chit chat about what's happening with especially the buy to let market, this sort of you know, the market which has burgeoned so much in this country. Michael Gove, the levelling up minister now out of a job, of course, had mm. been leaning into the idea of trying to deconstruct the buy to let market. I mean, some call it politics of envy. Some call it a political readjustment of a market that's out of control. Do you have a view on what the government is trying to do? And do you think this is something ultimately that you, as a, 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 a challenger lender, is a fearful of? Yeah, I mean, does anyone have an idea what the government are doing? I mean, it's... Uh, well, who, who the government it, is, more than the Oh, thing, yeah. or who it might be. I mean, it's, it's absolute <laughs> yeah. chaos. But it, I mean, it's good entertainment, but it just <laughs> makes this country look the laughing stock of the world. But hey, there's a lot of things going on at the moment to distract from that. But uh, on the buy-to-let point, that's really interesting. I mean, we were gearing up to go heavily into buy-to-let um, earlier this year. And clearly, Q1 this year looks very different to where we are now. Markets were booming. Everybody was looking how rosy the world looked and developers were developing, investors were investing and, and everything looked fine. And we were partly down our roadmap to launching buy to let And we did mark about five million of, uh, of equity to launch that product. It's very capital intensive, requires a significant team and um, a large amount of subordinated debt from certain funds to, to, to launch. So. We looked at the market, looked where swap rates were heading, looked at how much hedging needs to be done uh, of that product into the markets and thought, you know what, there's no margin in this now. There's, there really is no money from a lender perspective to be made. I mean, we were we were looking at the lending around 200 to 250 million in our first year in that, ramping up to about a billion a year. Uh, over a four year period. And we were going to be making uh, pre op costs about 50 basis points on that. So for every 100 million out about 500,000 before your working capital for your, your, uh, your op costs of probably around three and a half million. So it was a lost leader. Um, we looked and thought, no, we can't do it. And some lenders launched during that time into buy to let the government started to discuss the rumors of more restrictions. You're already in a very competitive tight market in buy to let with margins incredibly thin and some incredible operators out there, mainly the high street banks with Starling buying fleet mortgages and putting cheap deposit money through that. You, you can't compete. So luckily, we haven't spent uh, much at all uh, heading down that road. Um, just a, a couple of thousand, I think. Definitely not the five million we were going to spend. So the government rumours of a, a, a tighter restrictions and a more pro ownership uh, in the housing market as opposed to rental certainly made us retrench out and certainly made two or three other lenders I know of do the same and made those that are in the market still now their lives a little bit harder so there's a bit of a bit of insight as to, to how we handled it really. Just one other question going back to Glenn Hawk uh, as I said you're off market are you tempted to go to the market to, to list are you talking about the amount of money you'd need to expand to other areas this would be a great way of doing it wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, our uh, funding at the moment is a, is a quasi securitization. It's a bankruptcy remote SPV, so it's technically securitizable, but with the short duration of uh, of bridge loans, it's it's not possible in the market. I think somebody probably will one day securitize a pool of bridge loans. However, it, it hasn't happened yet. But later this year, we're launching a commercial term investment product, so uh, anything from a two to twenty five year. Uh, owner occupied, it could be uh, I don't know, a, a tool tool station or something that needs a needs a 25 year term mortgage, or someone that's purchasing and they want to convert into a 15 bed house of multiple occupation. So 
we're launching that later this year and that's a securitizable product um anything with term dated debt as you know uh, jeremy over a over a two-year period we can put into the public markets and uh, keep our rolling securitizations going which was very much how the buy to let portfolio was going to be uh, funded however with the swaps and with the market the way it was the, there was really no difference between taking senior debt on from the investment banks to, to dropping it into the markets um, and when it reaches that point, you just think, well, where am I going to get my return on equity and uh, and how are we going to grow uh, grow the assets under management? So this, the theme of the day, really, in the next three to four years for us is uh, speciality lending. The space is where the banks don't touch and where the banks start to retrench first is, is where we'll go into. And historically, businesses like ours thrive in, in, in times that are coming up. Um, but really, do we know what those times will look like? Probably not. But hey, we've just got to hold on, go for it and um, see where we end up. That was that's that's a really interesting point. Pretty much to wrap up on, I was going to ask you how you see the market over the next one, two, three years or so. You hinted at it there. Clearly, Glen Hawk looks like, according to your business modelling, uh, to be doing well out of this. How do you see the lending market overall developing over the next um, period, which includes presumably at some point another full election uh, and whatever government we end up with? Yeah, completely. I think well, once we've had. Um, the change of leadership within the, within the government in the next um, eight, nine weeks, that'll certainly give a bit more stability. I think a general election will clearly have some cause for concern, um, whichever way you, you swing politically. However, looking at the Tories and the tax rises that's happened recently, um, they're not really the low tax party anymore. Everybody knows Labour are a higher tax party. However, they're swinging towards becoming pro-business. So who knows really what it will look like at the time, you know, it may swing completely the, the opposite direction, but we'll just have to, to deal um, w w where it is at the time. Um, but from my perspective, the lending markets, I think whenever you see rumours of a recession or a slowdown, the banks are, are one of the first to start retrenching, um, tightening their credit criteria. And some are doing that at the moment. However, that's an opportunity for us. Um, we can we can serve that client base that struggles to, to to gain the credit when they need it. So there's opportunity out there, but I don't see the banks really coming off like they did in 08. They're very liquid. They have access to the deposit monies at the moment. They have access to securitization programs. So f from my perspective, I don't see lending getting any tighter um, because the world's awash with money. And I think it will be for, <laughs> yeah. for, for the next 12 yeah. to 18 months uh, easily. Interesting. Look, Guy, we'll leave it there. But thank you so much indeed for joining us. A fascinating talk. Uh, as Thanks for having uh, me. You are there at the CEO of Glenhawk. Good to catch up with you. It's Guy Harrington, the Chief Executive of Glenhawk, a challenger lender based here in the UK markets.